So we are going to continue with Paul's third missionary journey, which he started last week. So we'll continue on with that journey he's on. Of course, we begin with our prayer. Lord, your mission to the church to carry the gospel of salvation to the ends of the earth is the same mission that every professing Christian accepts in the sacrament of confirmation. In our study of the Acts of Apostles, inspire us with the stories of your faithful disciples that we too, empowered by your Holy Spirit, might advance the gospel and your gift of eternal salvation. We pray in the name of God the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. So this is Paul's third missionary journey. The setting, of course, takes place in chapter 19, and it begins with the city of Ephesus on the west coast of Asia Minor. True to his promise, Paul has returned to Ephesus, where he left Priscilla and Aquila in Acts 18. Who These were the people who opened their homes to believers and established a church in the city of Ephesus. The adventures of Paul's missionary team in Ephesus can be divided into four parts. First, Paul baptizes 12 men who only knew the baptism of John. Paul's separation from the Jews of the local synagogue, the defeat of Jewish exorcists, and the victory over the practice of the occult in Ephesus, and the last, the riot of the Ephesian silversmiths. So these are the things we're going to look at tonight. Paul did not do all of the evangelization in this area. He was assisted by, of course, Priscilla and Aquila, whose home was a meeting place for Christians in Ephesus. He also was assisted by Timothy and Erastus, who taught the converts, by Titus and others, like Gaius, Asistarchus, and disciples recruited by Paul throughout Macedonia. Paul also appointed Epaphras to evangelize in his own city of Colossae, and the Epaphras mission successfully spread into the Edosia and Hierapolis. So this was a movement that was growing, not only with converts, but missionaries as well. There are these people that Paul recruited to send them out from Ephesus to the outlying areas. Because remember, he himself concentrated on the major cities. He felt once they were established, then others could go out into the countryside who knew the dialect of the languages and the people there and really spread the word much more effectively. Colossae was located about 80 miles east of Ephesus. In this same region were the cities of Laodicea and Hierapolis. Paul wrote a letter to the Colossians and to the Laodiceans. It's one of the seven cities to receive letters also in the book of Revelation. So you can see these were some of the very earliest of his uh, first churches. So we go on. While Apollos was in Corinth, Paul traveled through the interior of the country and came down to Ephesus, where he found some disciples. He said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you became believers? They answered him, We have never even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. He said, How were you baptized? They replied, With the baptism of John. Paul then said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is, in Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them. And they spoke in tongues and prophesied. Altogether, there were about twelve men. So, Paul returns to Ephesus as promised. He will say his farewell address that he spent three years there. When he leaves, you'll find out that he actually spent three years in this city. The mention of Apollos is a connection to what happened in chapter 18, where the gifted orator and scripture scholar, Apollos of Alexandria, Egypt, left Ephesus after being properly catechized in the gospel of Jesus Christ by this Christian couple, Aquila and Priscilla. Apollos went to Corinth, where he became a minister to the Christian community, that Paul founded there. Paul's dearest friends, 
Aquila and Priscilla had a church home here in Ephesus where most of the Christians came to worship. But it is unlikely these 12 men were from their community because they were not properly catechized. Apollos was in Ephesus for a time, but has since returned to Corinth where he is teaching the church. So it couldn't have been through them that these 12 men received their teaching. Because as you said, they didn't even know there was a Holy Spirit. So someone else did their initial catechizing. At Ephesus, Paul discovers that there were some people who were at the same state of knowledge as Apollos was before he was catechized. They had an experience of baptism. They knew about the repentance of St. John the Baptist, which was in preparation for the coming of the kingdom, but they had not yet experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus Christ. These people were apparently unaware that the promises of the Messiah had been fulfilled and that the gift of God's Spirit consequently was poured upon believers in abundant grace. Now, it's not the first time that disciples met people who have only been experienced the one kind of baptism by John the Baptist or who had been baptized in the name of Jesus but had not yet received the Holy Spirit. So when Paul baptizes them and lays his hands upon them as a sign of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, they begin to talk in languages previously unknown to them, and they begin to prophesy. It was an experience similar to those of the apostles at Pentecost. The laying on of hands since Old Testament times is probably the distinction between the two baptisms. John baptized with water. You can baptize with the baptism of Jesus with water, but unless there is a laying on of hands, the Holy Spirit does not come. So that's probably where this whole controversy was laying on. The laying on of hands is a very old tradition in the Old Testament times. It's a sign of transference of power and authority. From the time of the apostles and in fulfillment of Jesus' will, the gift of the Spirit of God has been imparted to the baptized by the laying on of hands, which completes the grace of baptism. In Hebrews, St. Paul says that baptism and the laying on of hands are part of the basics that were taught by Christ. And the imposing of hands is recognized by our own Catholic tradition, as the origin of the Sacrament of Confirmation, in which the grace received at Pentecost is perpetuated in the Church in every generation. And you notice whenever there is, within Baptism and Confirmation, holy orders, those are the times when laying on of hands takes place. You notice at RCIA, when they hit Lent and they start doing the scrutinies, the priest comes down and lays hands upon each and every one of them. Again, it's the imparting of the Holy Spirit to these people. Now, one of the manifestations of the indwelling of the power of the Holy Spirit is speaking in tongues, and that's caused a lot of controversy within our church. We really don't understand it properly. I've been in, in some places where there are charismatic meetings where people are sort of just babbling, and they say, oh, they're speaking in tongues, but really in the scriptural sense, it should be a real language. You should be able, or someone should be able to recognize it. So it's not just a random sort of babbling of noise that people are making. It is a truly a miracle that the Holy Spirit gave these people that sort of gift that they could now go out and, and spread the, the word through actual language. So, yeah. Yes, the language of their time. <laughs> it doesn't quite work like that. <laughs> yeah, it's a true gift when it's given. And it's one of the gifts of the, that we believe comes through baptism or confirmation, the laying on of hands. So some people may get it. Some people do have a natural gift towards languages. 
Yeah, it, well, that's another gift of the Holy Spirit, the gift of understanding, too. So that's, yeah, that's a whole different thing altogether. But if you were baptized and the person beside you, was, you're speaking their language and they aren't baptized, they don't have that gift of understanding. So it's really it's coming through the gift of tongues. It's just I want you to be aware that we go to many of these charismatic meetings, and you'll see it at some, you know, some Pentecostal meetings and some evangelical Christians who say this gift of tongues. And what they're really doing is they're going into some kind of trance and they're babbling. Well, unless someone knows what they're saying, we really can't tell whether it is the gift of tongues or not. Okay, that's all I'm saying. So don't, I, I don't want you to be highly skeptical when it happens. It could be. Maybe they are speaking a language we don't know. But it really was meant as a practical gift for these first apostles. And it may come to us as well. I do know I had a, a seminary professor who could pick up a language like that. He had 13 or 14 under his belt, reading and writing. He just had a gift for it. That could have been one of what was given to him at baptism. So it's, it's really not to say it doesn't happen. Yes. Why did John not He did, but he wasn't the Messiah. The, the Holy Spirit hadn't come yet. All he could do was the baptism of water and call for repentance. And he always said, there is one coming after me who will baptize with fire. Which is Jesus. Yes. yes, because now that Jesus came, died, rose, sent the Holy Spirit, Paul now has the power to do it because he was taught by Jesus to baptize that way. Okay, so that's the, the difference between the two things. That Luke records there were about 12 men is significant. Of course, there's that wonderful number, 12 again. Remember, we have all these numbers within the scriptures that have significance. And two, of course, to the, Israel, to the Jewish people at that time, 12 tribes descended from 12 physical fathers, but here he's talking again in a more spiritual sense. He clearly intends the number to symbolically represent the new church, the new Israel, that is descended from the 12 spiritual fathers of the apostles. So again, 12, there may have been 12, there may have been 14, there may have been 10. But he's saying 12 to sort of bring out the fullness of a new set of spiritual fathers, bringing the covenant forward. Okay, so let's move on. He entered the synagogue and for three months debated boldly with persuasive, uh, persuasive arguments about the kingdom of God. But when some, in their obstinacy and disbelief, disparaged the way before the assembly, he withdrew and took his disciples with him and began to hold daily discussions in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This continued for two years with the result that so extraordinary were the mighty deeds God accomplished at the hands of Paul, that when face cloths or aprons that touched his skin were applied to the sick, their diseases left them, and the evil spirits came out of them. <coughs> so we're seeing another tradition of the church coming to light here. As in his practice, Paul works hard to represent the gospel to his Jewish kinsmen. During the period of three months, and again, three may be symbolic. His three is the number of fullness. So he figured, I gave it everything I got. That's basically what it's saying. For three months, I taught you. So it's signifying an important event in God's divine plan. In this case, his plan for the conversion of the Jews at Ephesus. But as is often the case, Paul preached in the synagogue with some success and some opposition. When some of the Jews disparaged the church... He withdrew from them. Now, their disparaging was probably some blasphemy or some accusation against Christ. It was probably the same conduct that raised Paul's anger against the Jews in Corinth. They did the same kind of thing. Hardness of heart is not an accusation Jesus made against the Jews during his ministry, but it is an accusation applied to the Jewish leaders by Stephen and now to the Jews of the diaspora by Luke. He uses that same term. It signifies stubbornness, resistance in the face of God's presence or visitation. 
So they were resisting the message. And they were probably making all kinds of bad comments about what Paul was saying. And he got to the point where he couldn't take that any longer, so he withdrew with all his disciples and just set up his own place to do conversion. He stops preaching in the synagogue. He withdraws to a Hellenistic lecture hall. Greek philosophers met in the Agora, or the town square, to debate and discuss, but philosophers with students and disciples usually taught in some kind of enclosed lecture hall. Presumably, Paul continued to teach in this hall because the church home of Priscilla and Aquila was probably too small to accommodate all the converts that he was drawing to him. Now, Luke claims that all the inhabitants of the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord, Jews and Greeks alike. The statement has the effect of asserting the success of the mission at Ephesus. He's really saying that this mission was successful. And the word is used as a synonym for, for mission when he says he uses the word, the word of word. So Paul taught this particular way for two years. Paul will mention the time spent in Ephesus in his farewell address when he says, So, be vigilant and remember that for three years, night and day, I unceasingly admonished each of you with tears. Now, he says three years because the ancients counted even a part of a year as one year. So he may have actually been there for only two full years, but it could have bridged some other part. So he says three years. Paul's time in Ephesus was marked by supernatural acts that certified his mission as a person who had been visited by God. Sick people were healed and demons were cast out simply by touching that person with items that Paul had touched. These miracles recall St. Peter's miracle in Jerusalem when even his shadow cast on an ill person healed them. Now, the collection of these items touched by Paul supports that reverence of relics that we do within the saints, of the saints that we have in our church. And it extends back to the very earliest years of the church, as you can see. The, the faithful belief that miracles are associated with relics from a holy person. A relic is defined as an object connected with a saint, for example, part of his body or part of his clothing, or something that the person used or touched. Those are the three classes of relic. First order, of course, would be some part of his body. Second would be part of his own personal clothing. And the third order would be something he used or touched that somebody had. So authentic relics are venerated with the church's warning. They may not be bought or sold. Now, if you went on to eBay, and you will find that there are relics for sale. And every time I see it, it drives me up the wall. But obviously, some people have personal relics. They die, their family doesn't know what to do with them, they have no veneration of them, they don't understand the faith. So they say, oh, it's a nice little gold thing, let's put it up for sale on eBay, see what we get. I have a priest friend of mine who, whenever he sees that, he bids on them to get them back into the church. He says he just can't stand to see that happening, and I can't either. I think it's really bad. We had our own relic of St. Teresa stolen here at the cathedral. Yeah. Yeah, and the police, the first thing they asked, they, what's it worth? Can they sell it? Where would they sell it? I said, well, it's not supposed to be sold. It has no monetary value. Its value is in the spiritual. The person who took it probably was in great, dire spiritual need, and it clouded their vision. At least that's what I'm hoping. I'm hoping someone did not take it thinking they could sell it somewhere because that would be too bad. Now, as you notice, we have another relic. I had two relics of St. Jesus, so I was lucky. I had another one which is back out there with the statue again in a place where nobody can get at it unless they want to be burned by the candles all around her. <laughs> so we try to protect the relics a little bit better. So let's move on from there. <coughs> then some itinerant Jewish exorcists tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those with evil spirits, saying, 
I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. When the seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish high priest, tried to do this, the evil spirits said to them in reply, Jesus I recognize, Paul I know, but who are you? The person with the evil spirit then sprang at them and subdued them all. He so overpowered them that they fled naked and wounded from that house. When this became known to all the Jews and Greeks who lived in Ephesus, fear fell upon them all, and in the name of the Lord Jesus was held in great esteem. Many of those who had become believers came forward and openly acknowledged their former practices. Moreover, a large number of those who had practiced magic collected their books and burned them in public. They calculated their value and found it to be 50,000 silver pieces. Thus did the word of the Lord continue to spread with influence and power. Now, when they said a priest, it should be translated as chief priest and not high priest, as you normally see in the scriptures. There was only one high priest, and he lived in Jerusalem, and he served only in the Jerusalem temple. Now, the same Greek word is used in three uh, in the New Testament for both high and chief priest, so we have to make a distinction. This was not the high priest. This was a chief priest. There are two different words in the Hebrew to designate, which is why we can differ as right there. The high priest has to be chosen from among the chief priests, who are all descendants of the first high priest, Aaron, the brother of Moses. This is the third encounter in Acts between the ministers of the gospel and the magicians who practice the occult. In contrast to St. Paul's miracles of spiritual vitality and divine character, Luke provides an example of the falseness of magic and superstition. He records that the Jewish exorcists identify themselves as being the sons of the high priest or chief priest Sceva. It is unlikely that this is the name of their father, since the, really the name Sceva in Latin means untrustworthy. So they were sons of the untrustworthy. <laughs> Not necessarily their family name, I hope. <laughs> It's more likely that Luke is subtly telling us that these men are, and their claim that their father's the chief priest is false. Their motivation would be to give themselves more credibility as descendants of Aaron. So they were pretending to be sons of a high priest or a chief priest because that gives them importance. To claim their father was the high priest would be going too far, and no Jew would ever believe them. Because every high priest is known to the Jews, just like every Catholic knows the name of the Pope. There's only one. We all know his name. So for me to come to you and say, I am the son of the Pope, you would say, ah, yeah, right. <laughs> you wouldn't believe it. <laughs> that exorcism of demons was practiced by traveling Jewish exorcists. It is recorded by the historian Flavius Josephus. The itinerant jurist exorcist had observed Paul's success in casting out demons in the name of Jesus and decided to try and usurp that power for themselves by using the name of Jesus too. By using Paul's name and Jesus' name, they figured they could get the power that he had. Of course, when they tried it, it produced disastrous results. And that's because they were not calling on the power of Jesus through belief in Christ, but through the exercise of a form of magic, they tried to bend the power of Jesus to their will. That Luke records there are seven men is interesting. Again, there's that name, seven. And Scripture seven is the number of completion and fulfillment. The point here may not be that in the failed power of the seven men, but in the fullness of the Holy Spirit power that cannot be usurped by the occult. Seven is also the number of the Holy Spirit. Remember, he gives you seven gifts. So, again, it's not saying that they were powerful in the fulfillment, but that the Holy Spirit was, and they could not usurp that power. Now, it's not the last time this has been done, that people have tried to use something within the church for some kind of magic purpose. 
Have you ever noticed the, the relationship between magicians? What do they wear? Black. If they have a cape, what's the cape? Lining of the cape is red. Who wears black and red? Bishops. They, again, appropriate the dress of the church. The magic words that they use, what are they? No, that's a fairly new one, but before Abracadabra there was? Hocus Pocus. It comes from the Mass, the Latin Hocus Corpus Meus. The moment when the priest calls down the Holy Spirit to consecrate the bread and wine. So they took those words as words of power. So you can see it's, it's, it still goes on. People think they can usurp the power and use it for their own means. Now, so what is the difference between miracles and magic? In a miracle, the source of the power is God working through his prophet or minister or agent. In magic, a person attempts to court the secret influences of the invisible world to demonstrate his own power without consideration for being in accord with the will of God. So that's the two differences between the two things. And you have to be careful because when you're using relics or things, people want them because they think it brings power of healing. That's wonderful, and they can, but it's based on faith, not on magic, not on superstition. You know, yes, it's wonderful to have the cross of St. Benedict, but it's not the cross that gives you the healing power or the strength. It's God who works through St. Benedict. So we tend to sometimes forget that and start, you know, worshiping a relic or a thing and forget that it's God who's behind it. Yep. Oh, yes. 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 Oh, yes. Yeah. And some of them use are those ones buying the relics on eBay because they figure they are powerful. They have some kind of power attached to them. Yes. It is. It's like I said, they see the power of the church and they try to usurp it for themselves. And they think they can fool people by doing that. And that people will see that they're similar. Not quite the same, but similar. So if you're not very well educated or you're on the fence with your faith, it can push you over the wrong way. So you have to be careful. I see somebody walking around out there. I don't know why. Okay, it's okay. I don't know what she's doing. She's standing there, but keep my eye on her. <laughs> okay. Now, such activities, like involving the occult, it's like playing with fire. We have to be very careful. All forms of divination, telling the future, and magic or sorcery, by which one attempts to tame occult powers or gain knowledge apart from God is forbidden for us Christians, including the practice of astrology. So, again, I know very many Catholics who they come to confession, but they also go to fortune tellers. They think they can balance the two things together. They're hedging their bets. And they're not. <laughs> Believe me, they're not. As I said, such activities are playing with fire. As you can see in this particular passage, these people thought they could do it, and it ended up disastrous for them. They were beaten and chased away from their own home. And it could be the same for us. You're playing with forces you don't understand, and you could open the door to something that you can't control. So I know that we were always told that by the sisters growing up and by my own parents, don't even touch a Ouija board. Because I know there was kids think that it's a great game to play and let's find out what the future is. There's been so many instances where that has opened doors to people that have not been good. So just leave that to the side when you come in contact with it. Okay. The effect that we see here is what happens when we use the name of Jesus in a wrong manner trying to usurp his power. 
Those who had become believers, however, saw this danger, and so they changed their ways. They confessed their former practices of fortune-telling and going to the occult people. And then they also destroyed anything to do with the occult that they had in their possession. That's how frightened they were by this incident. Now, the books they burned probably contain magic potions, magic spells, different formulas. The value of the items destroyed was a very great sum. Although it's impossible to calculate because Luke does not tell us the value of silver in that day, we could just imagine, though, that 50,000 pieces of silver were probably a huge sum for anybody in that day and age. So it is the power of God that prevailed and not the spirit world or those drawn to the occult. This is the sixth statement of the church's continuing growth. The word spread across the western half of Asia Minor and must have included the seven cities that, of course, are mentioned in the book of Revelation. So we go from here. When this was concluded, Paul made up his mind to travel through Macedonia and Achaia and go to, on to Jerusalem, saying, After I have been there, I must visit Rome also. Then he sent to Macedonia two of his assistants, Timothy and Erastus, while he himself stayed for a while in the province of Asia. So Paul felt this spiritual call to return to those faith communities that he had founded in Macedonia and Greece. Before he ends this third missionary journey and returns to Jerusalem and Antioch. Luke also records Paul's desire to visit Rome. It is a trip that will, of course, reveal God's plan for his life. To prepare for his visit to the faith communities in Macedonia, Paul sends Timothy and Erastus, while he visited other communities in Asia Minor that were evangelized by Paul's missionary partner, Epaphras. The ministers of Christ continually revisit their communities that had been previously founded to ensure that these fledgling communities remain faithful to the truth of the gospel. And we see that even today. You see, this is part of the tradition of the Pope when he goes around visiting the various communities around the world. It's, he visits not just to say hello, but to strengthen them in their faith so that they can come in contact with him and with the, the word of God. It's a strengthening of things. That's why he does it. In the modern age, as I said, it is the Pope and the Magisterium who continually work to safeguard the deposit of faith that was passed from Christ to his apostles and from the apostles to their successors down through the centuries. The church is Catholic in belief and in her expression of that belief, which means universal. We all believe the same thing no matter where we are in the world. There isn't a United States Catholic Church or an Australian Catholic Church or a French Catholic Church, although sometimes it may seem that way and, and how they talk in theology, theological terms, but in the practice of the faith, we are all exactly the same. Yep. I have a question regarding the day when Paul traveled uh, to different places and he talks. He did it every day of the week. He didn't have any day. There's no rest for the Word of God. <laughs> In fact, Sundays everybody else made rest. He would be working. Just as I do on Sunday. So it's that the same thing. There's no rest for them. There probably was a weekly schedule, a day of rest. Uh, if you were religious, if you were Jewish, you had a day of rest. If you're Christian, you had a day of rest. But the rest of the people may not have. So can we say that what is the past is the past is the past? You can say whatever you like. <laughs> I'm not going to. <laughs> okay, let's move on. we got a little bit more here. About that time, a serious disturbance broke out concerning the way. There was a silversmith named Demetrius who made miniature silver shrines of Artemis and provided no little work for the craftsmen. 
He called a meeting of these and other workers and related crafts and said, Men, you know very well that our prosperity derives from this work. As you can now see and hear, not only in Ephesus, but throughout most of the province of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and misled a great number of people by saying that gods made by hands are not gods at all. The danger grows not only that our business will be discredited, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis will be of no account, and that she whom the whole province of Asia and all the world worship will be stripped of her magnificence. So, the makers of these little silver shrines and idols began to see Christianity as a threat to their livelihood. Artemis was a Greek goddess. She was the sister of the god Apollo, widely worshipped throughout the Hellenistic age and throughout the Roman world. The Romans knew the goddess as Diana. The original Hellenistic Artemis was a virgin hunter, a moon goddess, and a goddess of nature. However, the Ephesians Artemis was an Asian version of this Greek goddess and was seen as a mother goddess also, known as a, in Asia as Sybil, which was a, 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 what would we call it, a, a fertility goddess. This pagan goddess was one of the most widely worshipped female deities in the Hellenistic Roman world, and her temple in Ephesus was visited by a great many pilgrims who, like all tourists, purchased mementos of their pilgrimage, which were small silver shrines to the goddess made by these silversmiths. The worship of Artemis of Ephesus has been described as a perpetual festival of vice. The influence of the sexual immorality of Artemis' worship was a continuing problem for the Christians and the churches in Asia Minor. So, when they heard this, they were filled with fury and began to shout, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! The city was filled with confusion, and the people rushed with one accord into the theater, seizing Gaius and our Aristarchus and the Macedonians, Paul's traveling companions. Paul wanted to go before the crowd, but the disciples would not let him. And even some of the Aristarchs, who were friends of his, sent word to him, saying that not to venture into the theater. Meanwhile, some were shouting one thing, others something else, and the assembly was in chaos. Most of the people had no idea why they had come together. Some of the crowd prompted Alexander as the Jews pushed him forward, and Alexander signaled with his hand that he wished to explain something to the gathering. But when they recognized that he was a Jew, they all shouted in unison for about two hours, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Now, Archaeologists have discovered the ruins of a theater in Ephesus. Has anybody here been to Ephesus? I've been there a couple of times, and it's an amazing city. Much of the ruins are still there. You can see the ruins of the temple, the great library, and most of it is the front faces standing, and this amphitheater is quite visible. In fact, they still use it today for concerts and things, so it's quite something. So this is probably where this whole insurrection took place. It can hold about 25,000 people, and it was probably safe. It's the most logical place for the gathering of the citizens. And ancient documents record meetings of the popular assembly there, especially in times of crisis. The people rushed forward, seizing Gaius and Aristarchus. Gaius was baptized by Paul in Corinth and became a host to Paul and to the church, Aristarchus was another member of Paul's missionary team. He also mentioned in Paul's letters to the Colossians and his letter to Philemon. Paul may have been thinking of this frightening day when he wrote to Corinthians that he fought with the beast in Ephesus and of the afflictions we experience there. As in other times when Paul's life was in danger, his companions step in to protect him. Because I can imagine sometimes his zeal would make him want to run into that crowd and start screaming back at them. 
So they stopped him from doing that because I don't think even Paul could have contained 25,000 people in this arena. Now, so they, they stepped in. They, the people who helped him, the Asiarchs, were probably men of influence in Ephesus who promoted the Roman imperial cult and who may have been political representatives for a league of cities in the Roman province of Asia. They were very influential within the city, so they were lucky that they came forward to protect him. Nobody would dare to attack them. We do not know anything about Alexander. Was he a leader in the Jewish community? We don't really know. But the crowd evidently did not make a distinction between Jews and Jewish Christians, and they refused to listen to him. This man does not appear to be the Alexander Paul mentions in his letter to Timothy. It appears finally to be somebody different. Finally, the town clerk restrained the crowd and said, Your Ephesians, what, per what person is there who does not know that the city of the Ephesians is the guardian of the temple of the great Artemis and of her image that fell from the sky? Since these things are undeniable, you must calm yourselves and do not do anything rash. The men you brought here are not temple robbers, nor have they insulted our goddess. If Demetrius and his fellow craftsmen have a complaint against anyone, courts are in session, and there are proconsuls. Let them bring charges against one another. If you have anything further to investigate, let the matter be settled in the assembly. For as it is, we are in danger of being charged with rioting because of today's conduct. There is no cause for it. We shall not be able to give a reason for this demonstration. With these words, he dismissed the assembly. So this is the amphitheater in Ephesus. You can see how big it is. And it's quite an impressive thing, built into the side of a hill. And from there, you can look down a very long boardwalk out into where the port used to be. Of course, the water has receded some 20 miles away, so it's no longer there. The wharf goes out and it stops at the end of some piece of land. So it's a, but it's a very amazing place if you ever get to go there. Now, looking at these last two passages. First, the ancients thought that meteorites were sacred objects, objects thrown to earth by the gods. So there may have been a meteorite that was housed within this temple of Artemis. Perhaps they had shaped it into part of the statue. Or the reference may have been to the image of the goddess. We don't know. In a Hellenistic city, the town clerk was a bureaucrat who functioned as the keeper of the city and is listed as uh, such in inscriptions that are found at Ephesus, including Athens as well. The town clerk, therefore, is the voice of reason for this crowd. They would listen to him. The clerk says in defense of Paul and his associates that they are not temple robbers. They are not desecrating the temple. They have not insulted the goddess in any way. Any legal complaint should be filed with the court and presented to the Roman proconsul. And if this unrest doesn't stop, the people themselves will be charged with inciting a riot. As I said at the beginning, remember that all these people were all upset, but nobody knew why. They all just started to gather here because they heard the screaming and the running around, and nobody really knew why they were gathering. So that was illegal under Roman law to do that. So he was warning them, keep it up, and the Romans will move in. <laughs> and then it will be us who will be trampled unto death. The Romans took a very dim view of riots, and military action against them are usually swift and brutal. All that Luke has to say about the famed Temple of Artemis at Ephesus, the existence of a city theater, the authority of a city clerk in a Roman city, and the presence of the prestigious people, the Asiarchs, is all confirmed by other literary sources and by archaeological evidence itself. So this was a real incident. It did take place. It was recorded with city history as well as here in the scriptures. And of course, his eyewitness account is very vivid in this, in this matter. Okay? So we're going to take a little break here, and then we're going to move Paul into Macedonia and Greece. <laughs> Let's start again.
So now we're looking again at Paul's next journey. The first next verses of chapter 20 describe the first stages of Paul's planned return to his home in Antioch. So he's now on his way back from his missionary to Ephesus. This is the beginning of the end of his third missionary journey. The passage that he took is kind of unclear, but it appears that Paul will return to the communities in Macedonia <laughs> and then travel to Greece to visit Corinth, where and from there set sail to Syria. In Macedonia, it's likely that one of the communities he encouraged was the community of the Christians in the city of Philippi, who were probably still meeting at Lydia's house. So let's move on from here. When the disturbance was over, <coughs> Paul had the disciples summoned, and after encouraging them, he bade them farewell and set out on his journey to Macedonia. As he traveled throughout those regions, he provided many words of encouragement for them. Then he arrived in Greece, where he stayed for three months. But when a pot was made against him by the Jews, as he was about to set sail for Syria, he decided to return by way of Macedonia. So Paul says goodbye to the Christians and Ephesians, probably in the summer of 57 AD. He sets out across the Aegean Sea for Macedonia, revisiting Christian communities on the way. He was in Macedonia for the summer and into the fall. Luke does not mention it, but after leaving Macedonia, Paul travels to Corinth in Greece and spends the winter months there. Paul established a Christian community in Corinth about the year 51 AD on his second missionary journey. It was while Paul was in Ephesus on his third journey that he received disquieting news about the conditions of that community in Corinth. Christians associated with a woman named Chloe, perhaps her church home name, wrote to tell Paul that the community was displaying open factionalism. Certain members were identifying themselves exclusively with either Paul or Apollo, and it was that reason why Paul, Apollo left Corinth. There was also the problem of the faith community's unwillingness to take appropriate action against a member who was living publicly in an incestuous union. And other members were engaging in legal conflicts in Roman courts of law. While still others may have been participating in religious prostitution or pagan temple sacrifices. So it was evident that Paul needed to visit the people in Corinth. Paul remained for three months, and after a plot against his life was discovered, he left. He had planned to leave by sailing directly to Syria, but the plot against his life caused him to return by a different way to Macedonia, by way of Macedonia. <clears throat> so, so Peter, the son of Pyrrhus from Boeria, Baroia, I should say, accompanied him, as did Aristarchus and Secundus from Thessalonica, Gaius from Derby, Timothy and Titius and Trophimus from Asia, who went on ahead and waited uh, for us at Troyes. We sailed from Philippi after the Feast of the Unleavened Bread and rejoined them five days later in Troas, where we spent a week. So Paul and his team returned to Philippi, which you will recall was Paul's first European church, and there Lydia was his first convert. A number of Paul's missionary team members are named in this particular passage. Some we've heard before, others are introduced for the first time. This Sopater is a Jewish Christian from Baroia and his missionary companion of St. Paul. Paul calls Sopater, along with Timothy, Lucius, and Jason, his kinsmen, meaning fellow Jews, who joined Paul in sending greetings to the church in Rome. <clears throat> Paul sent this part of his team on ahead of him, but he kept Luke with him. They sailed from Neopolis, the seaport of Philippi, to meet Paul in Troyes. Troyes was located about 10 miles from ancient Troy. 
In Paul's time, Troyes was known as a Roman city of the Alexandrians. It was an important seaport, and the city became a Roman possession in 133 BC. And Caesar Augustus gave it the status of a Roman colony sometime in the late first century. Probably because of its importance as a seaport. It was one of the nearest ones for travel to and from Europe and for that northern western area of the Roman Empire. <clears throat> Paul left Philippi in Macedonia in the spring of 58. After having spent nearly a year in Greece and Macedonia, it was almost during this time that Paul wrote several of his letters. So while he was in Philippi, he wrote these particular letters. His first letter to the Corinthians from Ephesus, his second letter to the Corinthians from Macedonia, and his letter to the Romans from Corinth. So the Acts is showing his missionary journey, but at that time he's also written these other letters that we see within our scriptures. After his third missionary journey comes to an end, he is already thinking about moving westward into the lands of the Roman Empire, and his letter to the church in Rome may be an attempt to gain their support, especially financial support, so that he could then come to Rome and do some more missionary work. So, on the first day of the week, when we gathered to break bread, Paul spoke to them because he was going to leave on the next day. And he kept on speaking until midnight. There were many lamps in the upstairs room where we were gathered, and a young man named... I uh, can never think how to say this guy's name. I've got to think of it each time. Eutius. 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 Or whatever. Who was sitting on the windowsill and was sinking into a deep sleep as Paul talked on and on. Sound familiar? <laughs> Sometimes happens in our church on Sunday. <laughs> Once overcome by sleep, he fell down from the third story, and when he was picked up, he was dead. Paul went down, threw himself upon him, and said as he embraced him, Don't be alarmed, there is life in him. Then he returned upstairs, broke the bread, and ate. After a long conversation that lasted until daybreak, he departed. And they took the boy away alive and were immeasurably comforted. Of course, the first day of the week that we see mentioned in these scripture readings is Sunday. It's the day Christians regularly met to worship because it was the day of the week that Jesus rose from the dead. Paul's action in throwing himself on top of this young man to bring him back to life recalls the prophet Elijah, who restored the son of the widow of Zarephath to life, and the prophet Elisha, who restored the son of the Shumanite woman to life. In both of those miracles, the prophets lay on top of the boys that they healed. Jesus spoke of Elijah restoring to life the son of the Gentile widow of Zarephath in his homily to the synagogue at Nazareth. These miracles of the Old Testament prophets restoring someone to life prefigured the gospel message of salvation raising new life, both Jews and Gentiles. Now, the Feast of the Resurrection could have been celebrated in Philippi, and that was why Paul waited five days, or it was celebrated on the first day of the week, Sunday, in Troyes. The Christians of Troyes were meeting in a three-story building. The breaking of the bread, of course, was the reason for the meeting. It's the way the early Christians referred to our own celebration of the Eucharist. Paul's homily is a long one, because he knows he will never see these people again. And he wants to give them all the answers and knowledge and teaching that he can while he's with them. During the homily and before the Eucharist actually took place, this young man fell asleep and then fell to his death. It was the Feast of the Lord's Resurrection, which we now call Easter. How amazing and yet appropriate it was on that day of the Lord Jesus raised from the dead, that Paul raised this young man from the dead. So this was actually Easter Sunday when all this was taking place. So we go on. We went ahead to the ship and set sail for Assos, 
where we were to take Paul on board, as he had arranged, since he was going overland. When he met us in Assos, we took him aboard and went on to Mytilene. We sailed away, and from there on the next day, and reached a point off Chaos. In a day later, we reached Samos, and on the following day, we arrived at Miletus. Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus in order not to lose time in the province of Asia, for he was hurrying to be in Jerusalem, if at all possible, for the day of Pentecost. Luke was with Paul, while the rest of the missionary team continued on to Troas. Troas was located at the extreme northwest region of the province of Asia and the peninsula of Asia Minor. Asos was about 20 miles away. The journey along the coastline, however, was about 40 miles, so Paul had enough time to make the land journey before meeting up with his companions. It was not possible for Paul to make it back to Jerusalem before the memorial of the death for Easter, in other words. But, so he celebrated where he was in Troyes. But then he now had 50 days to make it back to Jerusalem so that he could celebrate the anniversary of the birth of the church with the apostles. Pentecost was a Jewish feast, but now it is also numbered on the feast of the New Covenant Church. And Paul has an appointment to keep with God's plan for his own destiny there. From Miletus, he had the presbyters of the church at Ephesus summoned. When they came to him, he addressed them. You know how I lived among you the whole time from the day I first came to the province of Asia. I served the Lord with all humility and with tears and trials that came to me because of the plots of the Jews. And I did not at all shrink from telling you what was for your benefit or from teaching you in public or in your homes. I earnestly bore witness for both Jews and Greeks to repentance before God and to faith in our Lord Jesus. But now, compelled by the Spirit, I am going to Jerusalem. What will happen to me there I do not know, except that in one city after another the Holy Spirit has been warning me that imprisonment and hardships await me. Yet I consider life of no importance to me. If only I may finish my course and the ministry that I receive from the Lord Jesus to bear witness to the gospel of God's grace. But now I know that none of you to whom I preach the kingdom during my travels will ever see my face again. So I solemnly declare to you this day that I am not responsible for the blood of any of you, for I did not shrink from proclaiming to you the entire plan of God. Keep watch over yourselves and over the flock of which the Holy Spirit has appointed you overseers, and which you tend the church of God that he acquired with his own blood. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come among you, and they will not spare the flock. And from your own group, men will come forward, perverting the truth, to draw the disciples away after them. So be vigilant. Remember that for three years, night and day, I unceasingly admonished each of you with tears. And now I commend you to God and to that gracious word of his that can build you up and give you the inheritance among all who are consecrated. I have never wanted anyone's silver or gold or clothing. You know well that these hands have served my needs and my companions. In every way I have shown you that by hard work of that sort, we must help the weak. And keep in mind the words of the Lord Jesus, who himself said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. Now, there are probably two reasons why Paul did not go into Ephesus itself. He would have had to change ships and go back to Assos and then back to Ephesus, which would have resulted in an additional time he did not want to waste. He left Ephesus under difficult circumstances, and he did not want any reoccurring conflicts to delay him. He did not want to get caught up in any more controversies like the Silversmith controversy or the plots that were out there to kill him. He really wanted to make sure he landed in Jerusalem at Pentecost. So he decided to ask the presbyters at Ephesus to come to him. 
Now, the presbyter in the early church was a member of a group we now call priests, who advised the bishop and taught the faithful. Together, they formed the presbytery, which, under the leadership of a bishop, was the governing body of a faith community. We have that same structure today. We call them dioceses, and under the leadership of a bishop, the priests advise and serve him and teaching of the faith. The presbyter was commissioned by the bishop, in this case Paul, to teach, to celebrate the Eucharist, and to baptize. Their rank is above that of a deacon, but below that of the bishop. In some translations, the Greek word presbyter is translated as elder. Paul's farewell address to the ministers of the church at Ephesus is his third long discourse. Paul's farewell addresses addressed to the pre, these priests is essentially his last will and testament. Paul reminds them of the standard he set in his own dedication to preaching the gospel. He speaks of his anticipated suffering in Jerusalem and alludes to his imminent death. He admonishes them to be vigilant in guarding the community, especially against the false teachers and prophets who are certain to infiltrate as soon as he departs. He commends them to God to build them up in faith and for them to be selfless and not materialistic, but full of charity. He testifies that he has not profited from his service and concludes that with the saying of Jesus, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Now the saying of Jesus that Paul quotes is not recorded in the Gospels. When Paul says, keep watch over yourselves and over the whole flock of which the Holy Spirit has appointed you overseers, in which you tend the church of God that he required with his own blood, he is referring to the blood of the Savior, not his blood. When he had finished speaking, he knelt down and prayed with them all, and they all were weeping loudly as they threw their arms around Paul and kissed him. For they were deeply distressed that he had said that they would never see his face again. Then they escorted him to the ship. At the end, Paul prays with these priests of Ephesus. These are men he ordained to ministerial service. And they are like sons to him after teaching and serving with them for what Paul says was three years. It is a painful parting, but they all commend their lives to God and his will for their future, whatever that may be. Paul's message to these priests is still valid for all priests today. We should have a high regard for our priests our deacons, and all those who serve as lay ministers in our parishes. We have to encourage those good qualities of a priest in our children and in other potential young men who may be considering a priestly life. Paul tells us we have an obligation to help them to meet those standards. And that's where we leave Paul. Yes? Well, I'm going back a bit, but when you said it was on my mind. Okay. No, because he will die again. <laughs> yes, but he wasn't... The death is not necessarily just the physical death. Yeah, we have to be careful we're not so literal in our understanding of the scriptures that we think it has to be this way and not that way. We talk of death in many terms. It wasn't his time yet, that young man. Yes, he was dead. Lazarus was dead. I know. <laughs> Jesus brought him back to life. No, it's not contradicting because what they got was not resurrection. It was resuscitation. <laughs> There's a difference. There is. Yeah, you have to. It's, it's a difficult thing. Because, yes, she says that you die once and then you're judged. But... When does judgment actually take place? If I die before you, when is the judgment? 
Ah, you have a personal judgment, but that's not the judgment. There's a final judgment for all people who come back to life and are judged by God. So it wasn't that judgment yet. It wasn't that time. Okay, yes, we do. It's a difficult thing to put your mind around. A lot of people don't understand the sort of resurrection of the dead and the personal judgment and the end judgment. But yeah, there are, there are two ways we have to look at this. Who can actually be died?